Hi folks, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, welcome to this panel discussion on how to prevent and respond to the most successful vulnerabilities and exploits by attackers. Okay, we'll start off by doing a little bit of housekeeping. So, a few reminders, attendees will be muted during this session. Um, if you have any questions, please submit them um, into the Q&A section and we'll give you answers to those questions in the second part. Okay. Um, if you would like a copy of this uh, webinar, um, please uh, let us know and we'll email you a copy uh, of the slides and the recording at the end. Okay, so I will introduce myself. So I'm Adam Siemens. I am a systems and security engineer working with GRCI International Group. Um, with me today, I have James Picard. James, you're on mute, James. Yeah. Well, that started well. Um, hi, everyone. I'm James. I'm head of uh, I, security testing at IT Governance. Um, I manage the pen testing department, essentially. And Cliff Martin. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name's Cliff Martin, and I work for GRCI Law, and I'm the lead cyber incident responder within the organization. Thank you. Okay. So a little bit about IT governance. So I myself, I work for um, GRCI, which is the parent company um, of IT governance. IT governance in itself has 15 years of experience um, within the industry, 200 employees. Uh, we focus primarily, as the name suggests, on IT governance, uh, risk and compliance solutions. We have more than 12,000 clients across six different continents. And at this point, we can proudly say that we have conducted more than 1,000 pen tests. Within the GRCI group, there is, of course, IT governance, but we have a European division for IT governance and a United States division. Um, we have a publishing division as well, who we provide basically publishing services, so books and toolkits um, around IT governance, uh, ISO 27001. You also have vigilant software. Um, once again, governance software provided by our team there. Um, GRC e-learning, they provide both off-the-shelf um, governance, risk and compliance and uh, e-learning, and also they provide uh, bespoke solutions um, to tailor to your needs. And then, of course, uh, GRCI law, um, Cliff, Cliff works for who can provide legal guidance, particularly around things such as breach notifications, GDPR, bits and bobs like that. And DQM, data quality management, will also provide um, the management of good hygienic practices and privacy when it comes to managing data and things like that. Okay. Okay, so what are we covering? So we're going to have sort of a reasonably open panel discussion here um, try and make it a little bit more less formal and a, a bit more kind of um, have a discussion around these bits. So what we're going to cover is the most successful vulnerabilities exploited by attackers. Um, then moving on to offensive and defensive approaches to handling vulnerabilities and then the controls and measures organizations should implement to reduce risk and then finishing off with how to respond to cyber incidents. So let's kick off. So with what are the most successful vulnerabilities exploited by attackers? So James, being our, our resident pen tester, would you like to kick off with this one? Yeah, sure. So a lot of the things that we see hit the news are and they're definitely out there. They are they have vulnerabilities like patching zero days um, and, and these sort of issues, which do affect a large number of, of companies. Um, but it does depend on what sort of attack vector that we're looking to simulate. So if we're looking for an insider threat, I would say definitely one patching is an issue. Um, so if someone actually gets onto your internal network, then yes, patching is, is of course one of the one of the easiest ways for an attacker to start compromising or get a foothold within your organization. <clears throat> Externally facing, um, these tend to be like zero days. Um, 
which are essentially unknown vulnerabilities at the time to manufacturers. Uh, and then as soon as they start to get identified, then patching or workarounds will be implemented. Um, zero days are the ones that often come from state sponsor attackers. They often have to be purchased um, through the dark web. They're not generally open, freely available because if they are, then the, the vendors will know about them and will patch them. Um, but externally facing generally things like security misconfigurations, um, having unprotected access to your web applications or, or disclosing um, your file security or, or file shares and things like that publicly. Uh, these sort of misconfigurations are, are out there uh, and we do see them regularly. Um, and probably one of the most common things as we see is that users are using sort of default weak reused passwords. Um, these can be enumerated online um, through web dumps and then reused against your organization's login pages and things like uh, reusing these against your uh, remote access or your remote VPN sessions will allow them to then access your internal network and, and so on. Okay, so we're saying misconfiguration and that kind of human element is also kind of a one of the big issues that we're seeing as well. I guess that all comes into patching too. So you need your IT team on top of those patches, making sure that when something happens, like a zero day, when the manufacturers put out that information saying, hey, uh, you've probably heard of Log4J, there's an issue here, we need to get that patch in place ASAP. Um, when it comes to kind of external facing things, James, um, what about like the OWASP top 10? Are you finding that that's a good indicator of kind of application vulnerabilities and things that you're seeing out in the wild? So the OWASP top 10 is a great list of, um, of web app and vulnerabilities. They also do the mobile, mobile app side of things as well. Um, we often find that a lot of the issues that we come across relate to authentication or access control issues. So essentially being able to access someone else's data and not having the right controls in place between either companies or users or, or, or um, self-registered users as well. So we often see that the, there's the leak of information um, through these sites from this, and these are listed in, in the OWASP top 10. Okay, great. Cliff, do you have anything to sort of input there from your side from the incident response or? Yeah, of course. Um, <clears throat> sorry, as, as James mentioned, so he, he focused mainly on the technical side of it. But what what you tend to see from a lot of cybersecurity incidents is how the attackers actually managed to get into the network. So with this, you've got to focus on things like the human elements as well. So ensuring that staff understand what sort of things have got to be in place, you know, you know, things like social engineering, an attacker might try to engineer their way in or trick somebody in, into giving them access where they shouldn't have that access. Um, this, this could include things like phishing attacks as well, which we've seen quite significantly. Uh, and I'm sure James will agree, you know, being able to attack the human is a lot easier than being able to attack a system that's very secure and hardened where they've actually paid attention to it from a technical perspective. Okay. Okay. So, so we're talking about sort of making sure that all levels of staff are, you know, are vulnerable, whether that be just people just opening emails, they're part of your attack service, um, all the way up to sort of management, I guess. Okay. The other important point to make is that it's not generally a single vulnerability that will get you um, attacked or uh, to lead to the major breach. It will be a multitude, it'll be a chain of events. Um, or a chain of vulnerabilities that will lead to uh, your personal data being exposed. It won't just be a single vulnerability that will allow that. Okay, so it's it's that combination of weak spots that allows on a, a threat attack to get a foothold in your in your network, I guess. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Some some good resources as well, James. Is I recommend is you know the cyber kill chain and the mitre attack framework where people can look at the sort of things that attackers are doing and where these vulnerabilities do exist okay great all right um let's move on to our next part okay so 
What are the offensive and defensive approaches to handling vulnerabilities? I don't know if you want to want to jump in again with this one, James, and then we'll we'll move over to Cliff if, if you yes. have to. So, I guess the the main thing is to, from my point of view, from a pen testing side, is is to test your controls, um, making sure that your controls are in place and they are functioning the way you're expecting them to. Um, it's a lot of the time when we're doing pen tests and we feed back the vulnerabilities that we find. Clients aren't aware that the machine's dropped off the patching cycle or that the dev has exposed a, a public facing web server or uh, the port has been opened through the firewall or been left open or not actually closed, um, which then creates that vulnerability or vulnerabilities. Um, but it's understanding what threats you're actually trying to protect against and what what data you're trying to protect or what infrastructure you're trying to protect. Um, so it's important that you understand whether you, you feel you're going to be um, a victim to a, a sort of like a script kitty, which will be a completely untargeted attack. They will hit anyone and not really care which person they compromise as long as they try and compromise someone. Okay. Or you have a determ determined attacker, which will be someone that will be targeted on your organization um, to to get in um, and that they'll focus on yourselves and potentially third parties around you, which may allow access into your infrastructure. Um, and then there's also like state sponsored attacks, which we're seeing at the moment um, where they are going after key infrastructure or key organizations within country and it all depends on what data you are holding and what you're trying to protect and what access you could potentially give to somebody else um, to protect that okay okay so it's it's understanding your attack surface area where are your strong points where are your vulnerabilities are what needs to be protected what's not as important to you and then just applying your controls i guess wherever appropriate Cliff, have you got anything to, to add to that at all, please? Yeah, I, I completely agree with what James is saying. You know, from a defensive perspective, you know, all that's important. But I think one of the key areas that, that everybody needs to consider is what are you trying to protect? You know, what assets do you have on your network? What are the risks associated with that? So James mentioned about um, understanding the threats associated with the organization. But if you can understand where those threats are coming from, what risks are associated with um, your environment, your your organization, your industry, those those sort of things, and and looking at the environment and the IT systems in terms of risk, and then identifying what controls need to be applied in order to mitigate those risks, because it's mm. all good and well um, just buying the latest and greatest you know appliance because the salesperson was really good at their job, but understanding what risks are being mitigated from that, um, you know. Is, is more cost effective for an organization. Now, now with that, obviously, from a defensive perspective, it, it's understanding, you know, if something goes wrong, what do you do about it? And this is where cyber incident response obviously comes in. It's having the ability and having the plan in place that you can, you know, protect against, detect and respond to a cyber security incident. And this, this obviously, you'll have your, your plans in place to say this, this is how we are going to respond to that. But if those plans are not rehearsed, uh, when it, when it comes to it, if, if you do suffer a cyber incident, um, you know nobody's going to know what they need to do. They're going to pull this this document out of wherever it's located and then trying to follow the steps, and it's going to be a bit of a mess. But if you have a well rehearsed plan in place that you that you have tested on a regular basis, you know at least annually, that you can say right, okay, such and such, we need to contact. Um, during these times, such and such, we need to contact during these times, and that that will include any out of office times as well. And the easiest way to do that is to look at the latest threats in your, from your organisation perspective or the industry in which you're working, and then coming up with those scenarios to say, right, if we were hit by um, such and such an attack, what are we going to do? And we mentioned log for J before, and that was a big one this year that talked about. Um, a zero day that was discovered on a on a very common uh, application platform that a lot of organizations 
even knew they had or didn't know they had. It was only when this vulnerability came out that people started to wonder, how we, is this relevant to us? But running through that scenario and saying, right, okay, log for j what, what happened? You know, what was the vulnerability and what was the impact to our organization? You know, what do we need to do if somebody was to exploit that vulnerability? You know, what, what systems do we need to contain, eradicate and recover as a result of that? And that, that could be the same for any sort of scenarios, you know, take a ransomware group, for example, run through that scenario. If we had a ransomware attack, what would we do as an organization and, and go from there? Okay. I mean, I've, I've seen personally that the NCSC has been putting guidance out in relation to kind of playbooks and, uh, and sort of sources, particularly with the, the climate that we're in at the moment. I think that, you know, having a look at those things, we're likely to see an increase in cybersecurity attacks. So, yeah, no, no, that all sounds good to me. Um, with regard to kind of these risk assessments, Cliff, how regularly do you feel that we should be doing these? Um, is this an annual thing that we should be doing or every time, you know, that there's an incident, do we go back or? So I think it's a bit of both. So an organization has to undertake a risk assessment, you know, as, as soon as they can really. Um, but then they should be reviewing it at least on an annual basis or following a significant event or a change within that environment. So then they can reassess the organization and the risks associated with those changes to understand, well, what's changed? What do we need to put in place, if anything? Are we happy with, with what we've got there? And, and James, when do you think the, the the pen test comes in best? Is it the at the end where this risk assessment and the controls have been put in place? Is that kind of like a, a test that you would do afterwards or? I would say um, it's very similar to, to Cliff's idea is that a pen test should be run annually uh, mm. against your organization uh, and potentially vulnerability scanning room even even shorter time periods every month or every quarter um, to make sure you, that ha nothing has changed within that period. Um, but it, it, like Cliff said as well, if you have a significant change in your network, then it's definitely worth uh, reviewing. If that data has moved to the cloud, for example, or um, <clears throat> you've migrated servers, things like that, things that will, will could change the scenario of that server, it's important to test it. Okay, great. Right. Um, if everyone's happy, it's got anything yeah. more, I'll skip on. Right. Okay, guys. So the next one, what are the controls and measures organizations should implement to reduce risk? So from my point of view, from an IT point of view, um, I think a lot of it for us is getting the right people in place in the first in the first instance you've got to have IT staff or security staff knowing what the systems are they've got to have the experience they've got to have the right mind frame um, and also from a, an all staff point of view is making sure that the people that we're dealing with within the company are aware of these risks and I found that we've always been quite successful um, creating kind of a, a security conscious culture through things such as staff awareness training. So it, it might be that you're the least techie person in the company, but if you're aware that there are risks from phishing, and what to look for, um, then you can be just as, you know, adept at making sure that the company isn't going to fall foul to a phishing email that leads to ransomware in the same way as, you know, making sure that your chief engineer and your IT team has got, he's a CISSP or, you know, he's got loads of qualifications because, you know, everyone's vulnerable with those sorts of things. Um, the other part is, you know, having plans in place and communicating those plans. So, so to highlight what Cliff touched on, um, the previous uh, question that we had. So if we have an incident response plan, um, knowing, you know, what to do, who to contact, what systems to look at, um, going through kind of like step by step those playbooks or, or whatever we've got um, to hand, that's always really great. Um, y you know, there's a lot of, in one of these incidents, there's a lot of uh, panic going along and people not necessarily, un you know, knowing what to do. So just having a piece of paper just to say, right, where are we? What do we need to do? Um, and then from a techie control, or kind of an IT point of view, I've, I've always sort of thought that, 
um, having logical and physical segregation, whether that be with data or your systems. Um, if you've got a database server and um, a group of users or systems that have no need to contact to that, maybe maybe they shouldn't. Maybe we should put a control in there to make sure that that's on a separate part of the network. Um, zero trust is all the rage at the moment. It, it's one of those difficult buzzwords, um, but at the same time, the idea of, you know, if this server doesn't need to communicate with any of these users, but it does need to communicate with this one app, web app server, then, you know, that's the kind of where the trust should start. We start from nothing and we build up, um, you know, allow that one web server to talk back to that one database server. Um, the other thing I would guess is, is sort of detection as well. So having the ability to be able to say, has something changed? Is there an anomaly on our network? Um, one of the things I'm seeing from products at the moment is that there's a lot more of this where a machine is much better at saying, one of your users logged on from a country that they've never logged on before. Is this correct? Um, one of your users logged on in a, um, an odd time or uh, a lot of data has suddenly been deleted from your system. Just flagging these kinds of things is really great or uh, from a network perspective, we're seeing a lot of traffic coming from this IP address going out to this one. Is this legitimate? And these kind of things really help us from an IT point of view understand kind of what's happening on our network, what's normal, what isn't normal, and when there isn't something normal, to investigate it. Because it's one of the things I find working in IT, it can be very difficult to know where to spend your time. Um, there is a lot of logging, there's a lot of alerts that are out there um, and, you know, it's difficult to know exactly where where to focus those bits. Um, the other thing I'm seeing as well is within the move to cloud, some of the sort of traditional technology that we've seen sort of on on-premises network based intrusion detection sort of bits and bobs has changed. The, the, the uh, where people are working and the, the things that they're accessing in the cloud are very different and there's there's often a situation where you might have websites hosted in AWS but your um, user management is done in Azure AD. Um, you've got data saved here, you've got data saved there in a cloud system. Um, one of the things that I've been looking into is CASB, so Cloud Access Security Broker. Uh, which does a lot of that kind of detecting the, the anomalies and sits between the kind of the access management um, that touches on identity and access management itself. You know, can we have single sign on? Can we see and interrogate where where people are logging into and that they've got good solid accounts? Um, the other thing is data exfiltration, looking at making sure that we've got good solid um, data loss prevention, DLP policies in place? Can we detect if someone hands in their notice and suddenly deletes a raft of data, you know, or someone logs into a system and suddenly downloads our entire sales database, you know, things like that, just being able to see it, um, those things that are going on. And yeah, from, from my point of view, from an IT point of view, those are the kind of controls that I've been sort of looking at. Um, I don't know if you guys have got Cliff, perhaps, have you got any kind of like guidance on, on what you kind of think or? So I, I think you've covered a lot of the, the, the controls there. Um, I think what, what what's important is an organization needs to look at it in the context of their own organization and the industry that they're in. And they need to look across controls such as people, process, technology, and then physical as well. So what are you trying to protect? Where is that information at? You know, who has access to it? Are they trained to use it? Do they know what good and bad looks like in terms of like um, access control and acceptable use policy? They're, they're the sort of things, they're the fundamentals for me, I believe. Okay. James, is there anything, you know, when you're doing your pen test that you're saying that this, there's certain controls that really, really work and some that, <laughs> you know, it's, it's marketing guff or, uh, multi-factor authentication stops us at the front door on quite a lot of the new systems now, sort of implementing single sign-on, um, things like this where multi-factor is enforced on 
on people's accounts because these password reuse um, scenarios where we get black where we get data dumps and try and reuse these passwords against clients or, or find disclosed passwords online about clients. Um, we get stopped. And obviously, the some of the passwords are expired. But when multi-factor kicks in, there's there's not much we can go do in this, in this scenario. Um, we can try and look for systems which aren't using multi-factor, uh, which can sometimes be the case. But generally, if you have implemented single signer across your the whole organization, then um, <clears throat> that is a fantastic approach. And I think from Adam, you 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 can then track for how many people, how many if your account's been targeted, how many. Um, sort of attempts have been made at a particular user and if they're being targeted for a specific reason, then we can look at changing that person's, helping, not helping change it, but changing that person's password, for example, to make sure they are secure. Okay, that's great. Okay, guys. Okay. One of the other things that I, I see anyway when I'm doing the pen testing is giving people the relevant training or the relevant time to to research and understand the technology they're implementing. Um, so it comes down to product knowledge. Yes, you may have um, an IT team or a few IT, a few, a few IT people, but they're not always trained in the new firewall that you're installing or the new um, system that you're putting in. So it's really important that relevant training is provided to these people so they are doing the best job for you from the start. Mm, definitely. It's, it's easy for like us IT people to get carried away with a the new shiny piece of tech and and perhaps we didn't budget for the training to make sure that we implemented it correctly. So okay. cool. All right. So moving on. How to respond to cyber incidents. Okay, so this feels like a kind of a cliff kind of a question. Um, have you, what are your thoughts on this one, Cliff? So, you know, we, we've talked all the way through this webinar around the controls that need to be in place. We've talked a lot about the documentation and the plans, the policies, you know, the, the procedures that need to be, need to be there. So if, if your organization, unfortunately suffers a cyber incident attack, then, you know, the first stage is just don't panic. You know, it's going to be very stressful. The organization's, um, going to want to resolve it as quickly as possible to minimize the damage and also get back to normal operations. But what you do need to realize is that something has happened and you do need to have the resources or dedicate the resources to, you know, um, respond to that cyber incident. So we mentioned before about having a plan, you know, if something does happen, have that plan where everybody knows what they need to do, um, which you know, follow follow industry best practice. There's, there's a there's a few out there. Uh, obviously, we've got the the ISO standards. Uh, we've got NIST. Um, we've got CREST, um, and various others. So just just following a NIST um, methodology, you you know, you've got the identification and containment. Uh, sorry, the identification and detection. So ensuring that a, an incident has actually occurred and what the scope of that incident um, includes. And then we've got the containment. So containing that incident, ensuring that it doesn't affect the wider organization. And then we've got eradication, um, which is which is eradicating the issue. You know, it, it's if there's malware on there, it's eradicating, getting it off the the the, the environment, the, the IT system, um, and then moving into recovery where you can then restore the system back to what it is, or it's fully functional again, and then putting it back into operation, following a number of tests to ensure that it, it's it's working as intended and it's the, the, whatever the incident was is no longer present. And then following that, an important step is is obviously the post-incident or lessons learned aspect. And this is the, these are the sort of things that need to feed back into the preparation. So this is, you know, we've had this incident this is what we've learned from it. This is what went well, which is what didn't go so well. This is what we need to change. These are the controls that we need to put in place, um, which then need to feed back into your cybersecurity um, approach and cyber incident response as well. Um, and that's that's where you will update your plans. And we talked a bit about the frequency 
previously and Adam asked the question, you know, how frequently would you look at your risk assessment? But this is the same for any documentation. This should You should have a procedure in place that, that reviews documentation on at least an annual basis. You know, if anything's occurred, you know, as, as most people, well, as everybody on the call should, should realize that, you know, cybersecurity is constantly changing and having the ability to review documentation on an annual basis to say, right, is this document still fit for purpose? What would happen if X attack happened? You know, could could we follow that and still recover the systems or does it need to change for whatever reason? You know, has something occurred that, that we didn't expect? Um, okay. And that, that's it at a high level, you know, Adam, I don't know if you want to add anything or Jamie. I think, yeah, it's having those plans in place. That that's that's I think is is the thing that really kind of reassures me when I'm working through anything like this. If we get, um, particularly not just from an IT point of view, when you've got an end user who has received a phishing email, they know it's a phishing email, or they're not sure and they want that clarification. What do they do? Um, you know, should they be forwarding it? to another member of staff to get their opinion or is there a danger of you know that then infecting more people um should they be sending it to the it department should they you know get a guy on the phone right away or girl um and find out you know does this you know show them does does this look like and i think having those plans in place not just a, an it um security operations level but also you know what do i do when i receive this or if something suspicion ha suspicious happens on the network or my system, how do how do I go about handling that? You know, just basic things from the idea of the end user thinks they've got a virus. You know, you might just say, right, you can isolate your machine very easily by just turning it off. That that might be a really great thing that an end user can do in your environment. Maybe not work in everyone's environment, but I think just that awareness and also just some basic staff training so they know what to do on the first port call and then you know once again your IT staff there's going to be you know particularly if you have a ticketing system you're going to see incidents that happen a lot um, and then you can start to say look I'm seeing here that we're getting a lot of phishing emails people aren't sure what to do well maybe that's where we need um, a playbook for the team to run through those are the incidents that we're seeing a lot of versus I don't know a, another sort of incident there's a lot of threats out there and it's really easy to get carried away i live in norfolk in the uk having an incident response plan for an earthquake probably limited use for me um however i do work in a business that you know could very well get ransomware or could be flooded um we live in an area of the country that's quite flat and there's a river near there that's kind of an incident that we might need to think about um Theft of equipment is one of those things as well. Um, having having an idea, what do I need to do? Or if, if we find some illegal material, um, knowing how to handle that, um, making sure that, you know, we maintain, you know, chain of custody and the evidence and everything is correctly kind of um, handled. Um, you know, if there's been some sort of incident internally where people have been abusing access rights making sure that we aren't destroying evidence and you know we can if need be we can bring a legal case against them but yeah that from my point of view uh, yeah much like you said i think a plan is the most important yeah. thing and I, I think that was pretty key what you said just at the end there about preserving evidence you know even if your organization doesn't have the capability to do forensic assessments. You need to have a plan that in the event something happens, which may end up in a, you know, where there's a prosecution or ends up in a court of law for whatever reason, you need to be able to um, collect, preserve and assess or analyze that information in a forensically sound way so that it, it can be used as evidence and that you don't destroy that evidence as you're doing your cyber incident response. And that that's, that's key yeah I, I know from from my experience often when you're dealing with an incident you, you kind of it's it's preserving evidence is the last thing in your mind getting everything yeah. you know back to normal and secure is kind of that that thing so 
yeah, having a having a plan that just sort of reminds you of that in the heat of the moment, I can imagine is, you know, it's it's one of those things that becomes really important. Um, from your point yeah, of view, James, I suppose you're going to say test that plan. <laughs> test that plan definitely, but we get a lot of cases where they've had a cyber incident response and they want to know how they've got in. But that's all great, but they've already changed the controls. They've already locked down the systems. So they've already contained the fact that the web, that they haven't got any outbound ports or publicly facing ports. So there's nothing for us to find. And it, it's testing that once you're comfortable, that you're happy that you recovered and you're back to a normal state and then performing the testing rather than adding to the traffic, adding to the the incident of us trying to then go in and find something that's potentially you've already remediated. Okay. Um, so just, just for clarity with that, James, just as you, you mentioned then, so yeah. what you're talking about is testing the controls that are put in place as a result of an incident, whereas the forensics would go in and find the root cause of yeah. the incident. But as we were talking about evidence before, it's about preserving as early as possible. And then as you eradicated and recovered the systems, that's when your team would look to, is there any other additional vulnerabilities that somebody may exploit? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, and what Adam said was test your plans. Um, so make sure that you're testing your plans. That if you're regularly doing pen testing and you're getting the same re results year in, year out, and then change it up a little bit, let's start doing some goal-based penetration testing where, where you give us a name to um access your data and we can use different methods and not just using a restrictor scope um to do that that can be alongside a standard penetration test or as a, a standalone exercise as well um can your blue team actually detect um, an attacker on your network and and monitor where he moves or or, or stop him in his tracks as well okay it's, it's interesting because i think Getting a good penetration test is is an art form, you know, coming up with a good scope because if, if you're not careful, you can just say, test everything, um, as opposed to just, you know, as, as kind of um, Cliff identified, if you've done a risk assessment and you know where the crown jewels are, it's it's this web server, it's this database, you know, maybe that's where you kind of want to focus your time and your money, um, particularly with a pen test to say, look, these, these are the things that we're really keen on making sure it's sort of secure so no that's a that's a really good point there um uh, i mean and it is very very difficult to know what to ask a penetration tester to to go for especially when time is limited as well and you know it's and you know budgets need to be managed and there's only there's only so much in the pot for for checking that security is working okay um right so is everyone happy that we've covered this one off? Has anyone got anything more to say? Oh, I think I'm good, Adam. No, I'm good, thank you. Okay, brilliant. So, um, so thanks thanks for bearing with us, folks, and, and listening through. So I'm just going to do a little bit of promotional stuff here. So in case you didn't know, we provide penetration testing. Um, James, would you mind just, just covering off some of these bits? Yeah, so these are some of the, the threats that we see from an external point of view. So your external infrastructure, um, obviously your web applications, so this will be testing your controls, your patching, your passwords. To an extent, um, we, we, we do limited password attacks within here. Uh, we don't want to start looking at all your users, obviously, um, because that will just be disruptive. Um, we've also got a sort of a goal-based assessment here is a remote compromise test. So you guys would provide us with a set of credentials that may have been obtained through a password dump or through um, through a phishing email. Um, and what we aim to do is we sit down with you guys and we scope, okay, where what data are you, are you most conscious of? What is it? Is it access controls you want us to get? Do you want us to get to your domain admin or or do you want me to compromise Adam's account or your CEO's account? And we'd we'd come up with a couple of scenarios where we'd look for we'd attempt to get to this um, these goals essentially. Um, 
And yeah, this will not find all your vulnerabilities on the network. It's not the aim. The aim is to see how we would get to that specific goal. Um, and obviously one of the things is also the human element, so phishing attacks. Um, we see a, a surprising amount of phishing um, scenarios where people click on links and submit data. And it is eye-opening in terms of, of, of the success of these attacks. Um, these are only a, a handful of our services, and we, we build custom bespoke penetration tests um, all around different organizations and scenarios. So if you would like to find out more, please please do get in touch. Okay, thanks, James. Um, we'll just move on to our cyber security and incident response. So Cliff, if you want to jump in for me, please. Yeah, that's fine. So this is similar to what James was just talking about. We, we obviously uh, provide cybersecurity incident response services as well. So we, we provide our emergency cyber incident response. So if your organization does have a, an incident and you do need some help, please contact us. We, we can help. We can walk through the incident with yourselves. Um, however, you need us to fill the gaps. You know, I'm, I'm happy to have that conversation with you. Um, the next one there is cybersecurity as a service. So this is a service that we provide as, as an organization, which spans across the, the entire group of organizations, as Adam mentioned earlier. This is to help clients yourselves to put the the foundational cybersecurity controls in place and having that ability and the support there that as a group we can we can help your organization, you know, span across all the the, the different cybersecurity controls, as we were talking about before, the people, process, technologies aspects. We've also got a cybersecurity health check there, um, which is a an assessment of your cybersecurity capability at the time of the assessment, um, where we'll look at the controls you have in place and then uh, identify any gaps that exist. Um, as part of that, there is a vulnerability scan, which is run, which is fed into the health check. Is that right, James? Which I believe your team does. Yep. Uh, and then the, the final one there is we've obviously got some training as well, uh, which is all around the management of cyber incident response. So what what things you need to have in place? What does a cyber incident response plan look like? What are the what are the sections you need to you need in there, and the considerations you need to make when when developing your cyber incident response capability? It is all covered on that that course. Uh, a couple of other services we do provide, which are not listed here, you know, we have a, a cyber incident response readiness assessment where we look, at, it's a gap assessment of your CIR capability to, to identify if there is any gaps and anything that you have missed in documentation and your own capability. And that, that that's where we look across, you know, cyber incident response, digital forensics, uh, vulnerability management, threat intelligence, that sort of thing. It's coming from a defensive perspective. Um, and then we also mentioned about rehearsing your cyber incident response plans, which is another service we do provide, which is tabletop exercises, where we do run through a number of scenarios, which could be linked to um, the risks that you identify within your organization or anything that you, you do want to care, oh, sorry, that you do care about, and you just like to test your CIR capability against that. And that's something that we can run um, from, a, from our perspective and work with your capability to where we could do any observations and make any recommendations as we're going through that. Great. Thank you very much, Cliff. Um, mm -hmm. And if you want to get in touch with any of the things that you've seen there, those services, or, or just want to have a conversation with our sales team, um, all of our details are here. You can get our websites for both IT governance, um, which is where we do our pen testing that James teams work for, and GRCI Law, where Cliff and the response team are. So you can see all the information there. We're on LinkedIn, we're on Facebook, we've got a Twitter, we've got all those bits and bobs there. And this, of course, will be in the slides that are provided to you later on. So, without further ado, um, questions. So, uh, we sent out a survey beforehand, and we were provided with a couple of questions on there. So. I'll do one of those now. So, okay, so we've got, what are some systems and network remedies readily available to eliminate such vulnerabilities and threats? So this is a, this is a, a big one. There's, there's a lot out there at the end of the day and listing the individual systems, the brands and stuff is, is always a difficult one. Um, but 
what I would say is it's more about understanding what are your vulnerabilities and threats, particularly. Um, if you're looking to remediate log4j, then you need to focus on that kind of a situation. But if you aren't running log4j on any of your, oh, sorry, the log4j um, library on any of your systems, that's not a vulnerability you need to worry about. And for example, so things like intrusion, intrusion prevention systems are really great. So that they're going to be able to pick up and potentially pre prevent very, you know, standard kind of network-based attacks. Um, making sure that all of your devices have a host-based firewall on there, um, particularly if we're not sitting on-premises and we're not all behind that corporate firewall. And this sort of goes back to the zero trust that we touched on before, making sure that each of your networked assets has the ability to kind of defend themselves as well. Um, Training is not a system, but I think it's really important because if you know what you can get out of the technology that you've got available that and, and actually access that, that's really important. If your firewall is all seeing, all dancing, it can, you know, really work great and defend your system, but your engineers don't know how to configure it to get it to do that um, or aren't aware of those features, you know, it was just something on the marketing spiel that when they bought it, thought it looked cool. You're not getting value for money and you're not getting the protection that that device provides. And it's the same with any of these sorts of things. Um, from my personal perspective, anything that automates a process for me is great. I want an antivirus that finds a potential vulnerability, quarantines the potential vulnerability, lets me know that it's done it, and then goes off and looks in my environment to see, has that file been anywhere else? Did it come in via a phishing email? Where are those? Who did they go to? Would you like me to remediate it? That is going to be a great response to something that is a massive task otherwise. Um, but yeah, that, that's, that's pretty broad. Guys, did you want to jump in at all with that one? Um, like you said, Adam, IPS that definitely hides your vulnerabilities. Um, it blocks a lot of the attacks. The same with web application firewalls. They will protect your web apps as well. Um, they they do a really good job, but they're not a hundred percent effective. Um, and this is why penetration testing is important because the, there is there is ways through these. Um, there is ways to evade them and things like that. And 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 these will these will help against quite a lot of attacks, but not all of them. Okay, Cliff. No, I, I think what you said was 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 correct. Um, I haven't got a lot to say about that. I think it no. goes back to your risk assessment. So as we were talking about, you, you mentioned about the threat, your, your threats associated with the system, but understanding what risks are associated with with your organization and look across all those controls that we've mentioned a couple of times now, the, the people, the process, the technologies, um, just to ensure that the, you know, you do have that defense in depth when it comes to cyber security and protecting your, your organization. Okay. Um, one of the other questions we had is in response to the recent threats increasing in the last few years, in order to be better equipped to protect against threats, how do you see the landscape of privacy and cybersecurity education changing throughout the next few years? So this is an interesting one. Um, I I do courses quite regularly. I have to keep my um, um, continued professional development up for, for different qualifications I've got. And it is a bit of a maze out there. There seems to be plenty of cybersecurity qualifications. Um, from my perspective, I think it, it very much depends on what, once again, the risk assessment. So if you're working with a lot of data and it's a lot of personal data, you know, you might be in a HR capacity, your business might be working with people, they might have health data. Um, there are some, you know, courses that and certification around GDPR could be really valuable. Um, be working you know with uh, health data in America um, they've got the HIPAA Act um, I think ISC Square provide a, a HIPAA certification um, 
you're dealing with credit card information, you know, within the financial services, um, awareness of PCI DSS, another thing you're going to really need. Um, when it comes to your general staff, I think that there's, you know, potentially, I mean, speak from, from, from us, we provide a lot of staff awareness on how um, to spot phishing, how to, you know, spot social engineering, whether it be someone calling on the phone and trying to get a little bit more information than they should be able to, or, you know, a, a message comes through pretending to be the CEO saying, why are me a load of money? It's, it's one of those things that, you know, you can get a lot out of those things. And in some ways, almost just as much as just, you know, throwing certificates at, at one person in particular. Um, Cybersecurity. It's always interesting. I think if you're in IT and you want to get your head around cybersecurity from a base level, the CompTIA Security Plus courses are really great. Um, they're updated every couple of years. Um, we do a foundation course as well. That's pretty good. Um, these will give you a lot of exposure to the different sorts of threats. They will touch upon things like incident response, business continuity, um, network security and things like that. Um, when you're looking at kind of more of a managerial level, um, obviously there's the, the ISC squared CISSP, um, there is the CISM, um, those are kind of like looking at that kind of what you need policies, processes, how do you do risk assessments and things like that. Um, Cliff, from kind of like a, an incident response kind of thing, is, is there anything that you would particularly say is quite good? I know that you're a bit of a proponent of the SAN certifications. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> I do like the SAN certifications, but they are very expensive. So, you mentioned CompTIA before, um, you've also got the e EC Council mm. qualifications, which are more specialist for if your organization is looking to you know, deploy your own forensics, that sort of thing. Um, I, I would look at the internally to the organization to, to understand what, what do you need, what roles, responsibilities, and, and what, where are your gaps when it comes to training? Cause you know, there's, there's hundreds, hundreds of training out there for, for cybersecurity, privacy, you know, there's, there's lots. And it, it obviously depends on which track you're looking to go down as well when it comes to cybersecurity. Cause remember cybersecurity is a, is a really broad term. term isn't it's it? a very broad term, yeah. Um, so, um, just just having a look at what it means to you and the sort of things that you need to look at. And you mentioned the privacy ones, the GDPR. You know, you've also got the IAPP as well, um, mm. which is a certification body specifically around privacy. Okay, James, from a kind of a pen testing point of view. Yeah, you've, there's so much out there now. Um, there's so many different paths to go, and I don't think there's one bad one or one, one really good one. I, I think um, if you want to get a baseline for your internal IT uh, departments, going down the CH kind of route, that'll give them a, a general idea of uh, network hacking and the introduction to to hacking. Um, but then you've also got your um, press qualifications. Um, if you want to go down that road even further, or your cyber scheme as well, or if you want even move more hands on course, sort of a UOFCP kind of style courses where it's, it's all practical, practical based led. Um, but they do take a bit of time and investment, like any qualification should. Um, <laughs> Anything worth having, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it does take a bit of time to, to, to qualify as with these. Okay, great. Um, so. Let's have a look what we've got. Some questions come in. Uh, let me just see. It might be a nice one for you, Cliff. So, what would you say is uh, some good? Oh, sorry, let me just read this. Um, can you recommend any sources for generic playbooks, um, IR, so incident response plans that can be used as a starting point? Um, so there's, there is, there's a couple. Um, so depending on where you're located as an organization, if you're UK based, um, the NTSE obviously provide a whole host of documentation that you can have a look and guidance within there. They also do their cyber incident response in a box 
um, which is basically a tabletop that you can do for your own organization, which provides you a couple of scenarios. Um, in, in terms of playbooks, um, as a, a starter for 10, there is, uh, I think it's cyberinsonresponse.com, I think it is, which provides um, a number of good starting places. Just bearing in mind, you do need to tailor them for your own environment and your organization. So um, whilst it does provide something to think about, um, just add the details depending on your organization and, and the sort of things that you're, that you may face from a, from an attacker's perspective. Okay. All right, guys. Well, I think, unfortunately, we're running out of time now. Um, you know, thanks very much for your time. Um, and those, those out watching us, I really hope that you've kind of enjoyed it and um, you've kind of gotten something out of this. And, and like I said before, um, please, you know, take the time, download the slides if you want. If there's any services or questions that you've got, let us know. Um, also, where we conduct kind of like webinars and flash briefings um, pretty regularly. So there's another one coming up soon, 3rd of March. It's with our CEO, Alan Calder, um, talking about the hot topic at the moment, which is uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and particularly the cybersecurity implications of that invasion. Um, the next webinar, uh, Cliff's going to be involved in this one. Um, so this is another uh, webinar that we're having on the 17th, and this is talking about data breaches um, before and after they occur. And that will be delivered by John Potts, who's the head of our GRCI legal team, and um, Cliff um, from today, who uh, is in our GRCI um, law team incident response. Well, wow. all right, so please register for those if you're interested. Um, and if you have any feedback or anything about about the session, you know, please please let us know um, how we can improve this, do a better thing in the future, um, or if there's ideas for the format, we're always keen to to you know to hear what you've got to say. All right, so thank you very much for everyone for attending. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.